Hey there, welcome back to the show. I'm here with Sky Jotani. Hi, Phil. Hi, who is just back from his audition for Newsies. <laughs> Did you get the part? Always. And he's wearing a driving cap. And I'm a looking little chilly. Kind of newsboy -ish. It's hard being bald. Newsboy-ish, and yeah. not in the Peter Furler sense of the word. And uh, Christian Taylor's back. Hi, Phil Vischer. Hi, where have you been all my life? I have been busy making movies. Well, that's weird. I know. That's not that's what I normally do. not what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, let's sing the theme song, shall we? Everyone sing with me together, but not Sky. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Feel of Issue podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi. And Christian, too. Hello. And we got no guest. No, nobody's here for you. But it's us, and Christian's here, and she's kind of turned into a guest because it's been so long since she's been here. <laughs> hey, it's a podcast, so Linda here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Did you hear a noise? I did. Was what was, was that? that? Was that? Was that? Lots of banging and clapping. It's very windy outside. Was that an intern? Did an intern fall over? No, no. It was somebody outside. Okay, somebody outside. Maybe the garbage bin. So how's your movie? You're it's, making a low-budget movie all over northern Illinois. I am. It's a SAG, you know, low-budget film, and but wrang, it looks the, like a million bucks. You're the extra wrangler. I am. Extras casting director, thank you very much. Are there scenes with large numbers of extras? <laughs> yes. I'm still trying to cast over 100 yeah, for, for Monday, November 27th in, in Union, Rockford. Illinois. Oh, so Union. if you were listening and close by... What's the criteria? Um, you have to be, uh, you know... Available for that day and what day? Monday, November twenty seventh. Well, gee, that's coming right up. I that's in a week. I know, and I like have like thirty extras at the moment. So anyway, do, do they do they all have to be like white, African American, oh, so little glad, people? I'm so glad what, you what, asked. what do you need? Um, yes. So the majority that we need um, are African American, actually, and um, that's rather hard to find in the, like the western suburbs of. Sh the far west mm -hmm. suburbs of Chicago. Um, and we are looking for people who are interested in going back to the 1920s. So mm. this I'm film- I'm not sure too many African-Americans want to go back to the 1920s. <laughs> Precisely the Except problem. in New York City. It was a groovy time in New York City. Was yeah. it? Yeah, it was mm. the Harlem Renaissance, man. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, that Maybe was awesome. Harlem, but not Western Illinois. Yeah, this is no, farm country. It takes place famous. in New England. Yeah. And so it's like this backwoods farming community outside of Boston. And it's a 1920s murder mystery with an H.P. Lovecraft twist. So it's a very mm. interesting story. And you can look it up on IMDb. What's the pay? What's the pay? Oh, wow. It's IMDb credit and food all day. And you get a digital copy of the film and invited to the premiere. Are you? Is it filming oh. outside? Um. Parts of it, yes. Because it's cold I know, on November 27th. I know. I know. We're no, praying for warm under weather. under the lights. Once they turn on the big Hollywood lights. But you know what's incredible? Have you guys ever been to the Illinois Railway Museum? I have not. No. No? I have not. It's phenomenal. Yeah. They have all these rail cars, like yeah. from, I don't know, the 1800s or whatever, perfectly, pristinely preserved. Ooh, do you like how wow, I did that? Wow, that was really good. Yeah. And, and so you step on them, and you feel like like there was a Mayor Daly poster on one of them yeah. from the very first time that he ran. Oh, like fun. and it's all still in there. So it's like you. Step you back could in be time. a tour guide for the Illinois I Railroad could, after Museum. After this, I certainly could. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, the canal boats in LaSalle, as well as the Hegar and the Karras LaSalle Mansion. canal boats, the LaSalle and boats. Yes, canal. the canal and boats, LaSalle, LaSalle canal boats. <laughs> The Sal Canal. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Wonderful. Sky also has something to announce. I do. I what do. What is it? Black Friday's coming up. It is. I, I ignore that day. We are going to redeem Black Friday. Oh, wonderful. Mm. How are you going to do that? We're going to have Jesus Friday. We're going to have Back Sky Day. Back Sky Day. How does Back that happen? Sky. Back Sky Day. So, some folks may not know this, but the work I do is under a nonprofit ministry called Measure the Clouds that is funded by donors who made it possible this last year for me to write three books. Whoa. And a hundred and no, 260 devotionals. Whoa. And I spoke at, what were the numbers? I think I spoke at 11 churches, eight colleges, and 18 conferences in five countries. 
wow. in the last year. All that because people are kind of backing my ministry to be independent and all that. So anyway, uh, if you want to back Sky Day, there's two ways you can do that. One is on my um, website. You can go to skyjatani.com and there's a donate button. And if you donate any amount to my ministry, as little as $2, you automatically get signed up for the With God Daily devotional and the archives. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly kind of reoccurring thing, which is great for our budgeting purposes. But here's the real special one. Have you heard of Amazon Smile? Yes. Yeah, I've heard of that. So Amazon has a, a, a thing called Amazon Smile. It's exactly the same as the regular Amazon site, same product, same prices, all that. But you can designate that half a percentage of all your purchases gets donated by Amazon to a nonprofit organization. And Measure the Clouds Ministries is registered now with Amazon Smile. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Sorry. that's Jeff Bezos calling to yeah. congratulate so you. So if you do your, your Christmas shopping this year through Amazon Smile and you designate Measure the Clouds Ministries as your kind of go-to thing, they will automatically donate that money to my work. So you can go to my website page again, skyjatani.com, uh, hit the donate button, and it will... It's my son calling me. He's well, home What alone. happened to Do Jeff Not Disturb? Bezos. Well, I don't know. It didn't. It says Do Jeff Not Disturb. Jeff Bezos I know. So anyway, uh, that way you can pay nothing extra and still support my work. Wow. by signing up. But the steps to sign up for Amazon Smile, it's pretty simple, but you get that on my website. So, so I can help you without it costing me anything. Exactly. That's biblical, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's... it's, it's Maybe you should talk to Isaac. I probably should. Um, <laughs> instead of neglecting my children. Right. right. Um, Prioritize your family, we're man. Gonna pause. I think we're going to pause the podcast Station identification. for just a second so Sky can call his son so back. You know this is going to be about some video game, or he's freaking out because he's been watching Stranger Things. We're back from our break. Sorry. Sky found out that everything is okay. Everything's everything fine. is okay. I we hope. know that some of you probably launched your local prayer chains <laughs> out of concern, but it's okay. Yeah, he's fine. Uh, anyway, so back um, sky day. Back sky day. You can either donate directly to the ministry or through Amazon. I thought Amazon it was Smile. the one day a year where where your wife gets up the nerve to shave your back. <laughs> that would probably require more than one day a year. <laughs> okay, you're a hairy guy. It, you it's not on your head, but it's you everywhere did. else. That's how the Jatani's roll. How about that? Yeah, it's kind of downward, nice to know. Mm -hmm. Downward. From you know, my, our listeners. Feet, I'm like a hobbit. <laughs> Really? Our listeners are really getting an intimate, intimate yeah, look that's here. that's fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, so what are we talking about today? We asked you guys to ask us some questions. We're doing that. It's uh, Thanksgiving week. Mm -hmm. These are what, that's what we're thankful for you and your questions, which came in uh, fairly rapidly. So, do you want to hear some questions? I was really, I hope that there's none for me. Or that you... Well, you got to participate in all of this. I know, the but you didn't give me any all of this. I have no heads up yet. I barely even checked my let's, Twitter feed. Let's start out with a Thanksgiving-themed question, okay? Because mm. it's Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. Guys, what's your favorite part of the Thanksgiving dinner? Like mm. the food itself or the collection of people? Do you eat people? No, but at like dinner? I'm you can either answer both. Up. Answer yeah. both. Yeah, whatever you want, Sky. Is it the bread or the circuses that they're interested whatever in? Whatever you want, Sky. Okay, just wondering. For me, because I'm trying to be low carb, it's so it's pretty much just turkey. That's, that's well, the actually, dinner. Well, actually, that's not it's the right answer. Turkey. You're, you're turkey. supposed to answer what's your favorite part. It still is the turkey. Really? I like turkey. Okay. I like turkey. Do you, eat turkey do you put other cranberry than Christmas? on it? I'm pro turkey. I do. I eat turkey other than Christmas or Thanksgiving. Uh, no, I'm avoiding sugar. And I don't like to make my turkey sweet. I like to make it salty. Hmm. Okay. Good I'm, to know. I'm a salty more than a mm. sweet. What about you? Favorite part? Uh, my favorite part is a tie between the sweet potato casserole with marshmallows on top and the corn casserole, cornbread casserole that I make, the Jiffy cornbread casserole. Do you guys have that? No. Oh, my family like it. Jiffy cornbread casserole. Yeah. Well, it's, like, get my... like kernel corn and it, cream corn yeah. and sour cream and butter and Jiffy cornbread mix. Is it carb free? Oh, it's delicious. I don't think so. No, mm -hmm. I don't think okay. so either. But anyway, that and turkey and cram. I like the cranberry, like real cranberry stuff on my turkey. All not, right. not the sliced canned cranberry no. sauce. I like the cranberry like the that thing. slides out, that extrudes out <laughs> of the, mm -hmm. the can. The way I God intended. It. Yeah. yeah. It's very easy. Uh, Amanda makes this really fantastic cornbread stuffing. Mm, that sounds cornbread good. With cranberries, stuff. dried cranberries in it, and, oh. and like this sausage. It's just, it's very much not low carb Whoa. or low calorie. And is it an old family True. recipe handed I don't down? I think so. I think she came, She found this recipe Pilgrim heritage. early on in our marriage. And, you know, we get together with other family. Everyone brings a dish, and her thing is always okay. the stuffing. And it's so good. It's really, really I'm good. I'm going to come to but your house. I also have a sweet tooth, and I, I have a weakness for 
um, any sort of pumpkin dessert. Oh, I like pumpkin, pumpkin pie. pie yeah. I'm a big pumpkin pie. Me pumpkin too. Pie. With ice cream or with whipped cream or with both or with neither. Mm. I'll whipped have cream. it any way you give it to me. Any way. I like it warm though. Do I you actually like it warm? cold. You do? I do like, I like it cold. It I like it for breakfast. Have you ever had it for breakfast? I'll have oh, it's it so anytime, good. anywhere, <laughs> any place. In a box with a fox, <laughs> I will have it. I have, I, me too. Oh, I'm I the same. I want pumpkin pie for breakfast. I'm a pumpkin fan. I really like any Thanksgiving anything that someone else makes. Yeah. Have you guys ever tried to make? Oh, I always have to make it no. every year for my whole family. No, I've never. We've. Do you know? Do you know what state produces <sighs> more pumpkins than any other? This is just one of our questions. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this is just good trivia. Okay, right, let others. me guess. Can I produces guess? Produces more yeah. what? More pumpkins. More pumpkins than any other state. Illinois. The pumpkin state. Illinois. Illinois. Really? Yeah. We are the number one producer of pumpkins in the United Why States. Why would that be? I don't know. Because we just decided to. Oh, well, when we set our minds to something, we, we just, just do it. knock it right like, out. Like our, our uh, state debt. Yeah. <laughs> we set our minds to have the lowest financial health of any state, and we just did it. But we have pumpkins, darn it. But we're up to our eyeballs in pumpkins, pumpkins and debt. And corn. And corn. Lots of corn. We have a lot of corn. Do you okay. know that... Can I move on? Please, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Let's get a little more serious. Okay. 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 In light of all the recent sexual harassment accusations, okay. can I go from Thanksgiving to sexual you harassment? just did. It's too late to turn back no, now. Well, from uh, never too to late punks. to turn back. Is it time for public figures to reconsider the VP Pence rules? The also known oh, as the Billy Graham, Billy Graham rule. This Did you see Caitlin Beatty? Our friend Caitlin Beatty wrote a great piece yes. in the New York Times about this. Tell me yes. what this was. And Fox didn't... News didn't like it, or some conservatives didn't like it. I didn't yeah. see her there piece. Was a write-up uh, she basically was arguing why the Mike Pence rule is bad for women. Can you explain the Mike Pence rule and then how it relates yes. back to the Billy if, Graham rule? If I recall. So Billy Graham back in the day had a rule for himself and the other leaders of his ministry that they would not travel alone with or be alone with any woman who wasn't their wife. Yes. Just to keep any uh, Imp- semblance a- of appearance impropriety. Of impropriety. Appearance of exactly. impropriety. And it was extensive. He, w- he could have a meeting with a woman in his office, but only with the door open. He could not have dinner with a woman without his wife or someone else there. Mm-hmm. Uh, whenever he traveled to a hotel, one of his staff would go into the room first to make sure there were no prostitutes that had been placed in the room. Had, did they ever find one? I don't know that answer. Because that would but, that would make it like justifiably understandable yeah, to be that yeah. paranoid. But when but, you when when you you know kind of hear the extent of it, you recognize that he knew he was a target. Right. That he knew he was a target. He knew he had enemies, and he knew that people would love to see him. Yeah. Come down. Right. Uh, and so that's kind of understandable. Although this was also the fifties and sixties. You know, and so women like being in on your executive team would have been very, very new. Right. If there were, were such, it, this was more likely. You know, he would have, like, madmen having mm-hmm. your secretary come into your office and then shutting the door and everyone going, "Oh, well, mm-hmm. what's going on in there?" Mm-hmm. Which, if you've watched Mad Men, you know, it's is always usually bad. bad. Right. Uh, so that was the era. Uh, Mike Pence brought some of these rules back, and he will not have dinner alone with a woman. That isn't his wife without his wife present. He doesn't do, I don't think he does the whole thing, though. Uh, yeah, all the different levels of it. The Caitlin's different. piece, I wish I had it in front of me. I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but it's worth reading. Uh, her basic argument, I don't want to put words in her mouth, is that while it makes sense because it's a way of preventing, for protecting marriages and preventing men from you know sexually assaulting women, things like that, the downside of this rule is it's a significant barrier to women advancing in their careers if they have a boss who's a man and they can never meet alone with him or they can't be you know travel to a conference or they can't do right. anything they can't share a room at a hotel to save money it's just a terrible burden well not that but well, it's, what i, what I, I will it say it creates it creates an, an easier way for men to climb the ladder yeah. within an organization than it is for women because they just can't meet yeah. with bosses and you know do things that other men can do it's it's a 
And the argument is that this is only necessary because men have difficulty controlling themselves, mm-hmm. which is a little uh, o- I don't oversimplification. Know that, yeah, and then she doesn't say that, but that's kind of the stereotype. Because I, I would think the issue is they are trying to pin some particular in Billy Graham as well. I'm sure they were trying to avoid the appearances of other people, right. what other right. people thought. I don't, I don't think, think Billy Graham was concerned that he was going to sexually assault. Right. Someone. It's not so much about his weakness. I don't think he was protecting women. Right. By doing that, but he was protecting his ministry. Well, if you're alone with a woman and no one else is there, and let's say this woman wants is is a mole to a yeah. plant to bring down his ministry, she could easily say, "Hey, he took yeah, advantage he, of me." Well, look at and the there's no Bible. one to refute that. Did look that, at the Bible with David Bible? and uh, uh, Joseph. And Joseph. And Potiphar's <laughs> wife. Joseph and Potiphar. Right. I mean, there's definite precedent for that thinking. But the other thing that's difficult at being married to a husband that works in a very professional job, his office is mostly all women. And he has to travel all over the world. And a lot of times these women have to go. And yeah. early on in our marriage, you know, I'm from this Southern, you know, mm-hmm. tradition where I was like, I don't ever want you eating, you know, having lunch alone with a woman or traveling or blah, blah, blah. Well, there's real. he has no choice. If he yeah, right. wasn't able to meet with them on that level, then how right. is he going to do his job? Right. But I do you think that reapplying rules like that is a way to address a sexual harassment no. crisis. No, I mean, it, I don't think so. I don't think it solves the problem at because all. Because that's what the rules weren't about. That right. The rules were about a, appearance and scandal. In, well, in, and I think that's part of the criticism. Those rules were designed to protect men and their jobs and their reputation. They weren't designed to protect the women. Right. And all they do is prevent women from advancing in their gifts and abilities and careers. So how do we? And so. Because I've heard some people say, well, we just have to teach men not to abuse women. That would be nice. Which, yeah. Perhaps it's, you know, there's there's also something in the Pence rule that troubles me because it could be something between him and his wife. What if she feels... Um, you know, insecure for whatever reason and has asked him to put that rule in place and he's yeah. trying to honor her mm-hmm. in his merit. I mean, we don't I, know. We don't, we, know, we the don't whole story. know. And I think it's, you know, it's a very complicated, nuanced question. I don't know that Mike Pence is making a rule and saying everyone else should do it, but I think we're. You no, know. He, he is saying he, I'm adopting the Billy Graham rule. Yeah. And it's I can understand and respect why yeah. someone would do that, but I think we also have to recognize this is not there are unintended consequences, right? And you do actually have to, and that's that's that creates more potential for tension and misunderstanding, just because yeah, you know, I mean it's like in the armed forces, men and women are serving side by side like they never did before. Mm-hmm. So guess what? There's more sexual harassment in the army than ever before because there are more women in the army than ever before, mm-hmm. and men, some men are still like men, like always before. You know, so the, I think the notion that men just change is difficult, but the more that women don't let them get away with it, you know, when you've got yeah. a jerk, just say, hey, he's a jerk, and, and you do have to change the culture of an organization to say, if something happens, tell us. Well, if something right? happens, because it, it goes, the, tell us. yes, of course, that's an easy thing to say. Women should stand up and say X, Y, Z. But as a one who has been actually harassed and abused by men in that situation and in a career where that is prevalent, both on Capitol Hill, where I was quite aware of the creepers list and this entertainment industry, you know, it is very difficult to say things to people in power right. if you want to. Do you do you have hope that that's what's currently changing? Like I, think I do think accountability from from others is makes people, whether they're men or women, I think think twice about right. their behavior. I wonder if the reason why this has been so prevalent for so long is because most of the men who do this or women. Or women, I mean, there but are, let's be honest, most of the time it's men. Most of the men who do this never really think there's going to be a consequence for it. Correct. And perhaps right. now they're right. going, uh oh. Right. I need to really right. think and twice. And quite often, there's another guy around who notices something's happening mm-hmm. and it also doesn't say anything. But well, can, let me just say this one thing. Yeah. I am currently involved in a situation where there is an elder man who is of that culture. 
and makes comments and says things or, you know, is affectionate to women just because that's the culture he grew up in. So let's he's, you know, 75 ish Mm -hmm. and he's not aware like we're having to make him aware of how those things can be taken incorrectly. All it takes is one letter from HR showing up on your desk. You say, oh, I think there's a reeducation also that needs to happen. Yeah, Okay, I that's fair enough. But I think I don't care if you're 75. There are some things which you have just always been wrong. Yes. That are currently in the news that yes. it's like, okay, yeah, you know, speaking down to or being demeaning to a woman or well, only, only of... talking about her looks. Things, okay, fine. But yeah. grabbing a woman, well, yeah. you know, sure. I don't care if you're 75, 105 or 25, that's universally But that was bad. one of Harvey Weinstein's defenses is that I grew up in the 60s. It was different back then. Right. Where I don't even want to talk about some of the things he did, but that's ridiculous. I know. Yeah, and we did that all the time in the 60s. Even, well, even Billy Graham used to do stuff like that. No, he was the one that would, wasn't yeah. having a meeting alone with a woman. Pick your poison. Anyway. I so. will say I am very thankful that this time has arrived. Yeah. And I do think there was a tipping point, and I think now you know the floodgates are open, and I predict this will continue. Like, this is not – we haven't heard the end of it. There's got to be a lot of uh, well-known men – in positions of power who are really frightened right now Mm -hmm. (laughs) because of things they did years ago. Okay, next question. Phil once stated he thought the term evangelical was redeemable. Does he still feel that way? (laughs) Phil, what do you think? I think this is like one of our first episodes. I remember with Oz Guinness we talked about this. Yeah, yeah. And I said I felt it was gone. The the, the term had been lost, and you said it was still redeemable. I am very, very close to giving up. I just don't see. It's just a political term now. Mm-hmm. It's not. It do, doesn't mean anything. If there is no, if there is no fundamentalism, there is no evangelicalism. That's my point. So R- Roy Moore is not an evangelical. He's a fundamentalist. But if we think he's an evangelical, then evangelical doesn't mean anything. All right. So are you close to giving it up, or you think it's gone? Um, I don't see how it it is. A meaningful term moving forward. Well, I certainly don't want to be associated with it. Well, so well. When did you give up? Um, well, I I was listening to you guys, you know, over the last <laughs> l- five years or whatever, uh, and so, so I kept. You, so you found so, Sky's arguments more so, compelling so than kept, my arguments. Well, I tell you what, this last year, and particularly with the Roy Moore thing, when I'm hearing so much about evangelical supporting this kind of thing uh, and I know I don't so I and I don't want to be associated with those that do mm-hmm. um, I don't want to call myself the, that well the big problem is is as the media uses it it's a self-reporting term not a term that's based on any behavior so you, you, or, which is the equivalent or of real say, facts like which or is real. the equivalent of saying you're a vegetarian if you say you're a vegetarian not if you don't eat meat Right. You can eat as much meat as you want to, and we'll still put you in the vegetarian bucket if you check the vegetarian box. And we won't ask you whether you eat meat or not. And that's the, what we've done with the term. Right. Evangelical. Okay, so Phil's no longer an evangelical. So I'm no longer using the term. I am a third way neo evangelical of the Akinge variety. Thank <laughs> you. Good. You know, Christianity Today is running a uh, series of articles. Mark Galley wrote the first one about this, trying to define the term evangelical and a good article but again if you have to spend multiple right it's magazine not, articles it's, it's to not try, useful it's not useful historically it's a great term theologically it's a great term um it's been killed it, but it, it's it's gotten so much baggage it's been debased it's not useful yeah yeah okay um hey guys what is one subject you won't discuss publicly <laughs> just one My view of the term evangelical and sexual harassment. No, you already just did those. Oh. Don't, that's, you can't take the easy way out. Go ahead. One topic we won't discuss publicly. I won't talk overly personally about my kids. Yeah. That's crossing a line. I don't, I try not to tell other people's stories without their permission. I told my wife many years ago that I would never try to build a ministry platform around parenting or marriage advice. Because I feel like I have no credibility. <laughs> yeah. So I usually, like, when I speak or teach or thing, I don't, I don't go into those topics. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Do you have a do you have something that you really don't want to me. get into? Well, can you define publicly? <laughs> I guess here. Here on this podcast, I'm going to I'm going to say. Yeah. Um I'm a pretty open book. Yeah, huh? And particularly when it relates to um personal things because I feel like um there are a lot of issues I can speak about, be they mental illness, you know, or, you know, things with children. And I feel like in the f- context of my faith and what God has done, I'm open to discussing those in the proper way at the proper time. So you can't think of anything you wouldn't talk about. Well, you know, there are some things I wouldn't talk about, but some people bring them up on the podcast and oh, then I don't have a choice. Yeah, I try not to get to talk about topics that are excessively sexual on yes. the podcast. Agreed. Because I know glass bottom pants that ring a bell. Some people <laughs> that's not sexy, that's just it's fashion. Okay. There's a difference between fashion and sexual. In your case, yes. And glass bottom pants. We, we do try, I think that we do try to um, draw that line of making things appropriate so that if we have children, yeah. listeners. Well, if, we, if you have older kids and you want your older kids, you know, not like preschoolers, but older kids mm-hmm. to listen to the podcast, I'd kind of like it if they could, because there's just not much you can listen to with your kids. It's actually beneficial to a Christian worldview. Right. So there. So yeah, uh, over, overt sexuality, I, I tend to avoid. Um, in Veggie Tales, I never wanted a fart joke. In Veggie Tales, did you succeed? I did. I think maybe they've had one since I was gone. And, <laughs> how and, how and would burping. a vegetable fart? I also don't like burping. Don't ask those questions. Sorry. How would a vegetable put on a TV show? <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> it's a fairy tale world of magic and wonder. Right. And farting vegetables. <laughs> no, I, j- I don't get into gross out humor, and so I tried to keep it out of Veggie Tales, and I tend to try to keep it out of here for the most part, uh, which is why the first two co-hosts I had to fire after <laughs> a year and then bring in you guys. Um, if uh, Oh, what's, one, what's, the, <laughs> what's the worst advice you've ever given someone? Whoa. I actually have one. You do? Yeah. <laughs> I have to think about that. Right. I was speaking at Wheaton College to a student group, and this was in the height of VeggieTales, and this was actually when everything was going terribly. And so I was trying to put how terrible things were going into a theological framework. And the only conclusion I could come up with is that if you're really trying to do valuable work for God, it's going to be really hard and not fun. <laughs> wow. And so <laughs> Dan said, just get it's, ready it's, for but it, But that's kids. the evangelical persecution complex. I know. I know. Yeah. I promoted the evangelical persecution complex. Right. At Wheaton College. So like, and I actually had, there was a faculty member there who stood up and, and kind of disputed me in the Q&A period. And I was like, wait, what? Aren't you having a miserable time too? <laughs> Aren't we all miserable? That's, that's, the, that's like the same argument that if, if you're a conservative Christian running for the Senate, you're going to be accused of molesting 14-year-olds. I'm not sure I followed you to that. Well, that's connection. that's what that's what the Roy Moore campaign is trying to oh, say oh, okay. is the reason why yeah, these accusations because are. he's a Christian. Because he's a good guy. Right. You're accused of bad things if you're a good guy. Right. Because Satan is throwing stuff at your head. Exactly. I think I actually said that Satan's going to throw stuff at your head. So get ready. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's not that is not. There is, I mean, there is some merit. Spiritual warfare. There is some merit yes, in that. But and but that was before I really had a run-in with uh, Paul and the fruit of the Spirit and had to stare long and hard at the words, uh, your life will be marked by peace, love, and joy Right. if you're walking with Jesus. And then I tried to justify it by saying, if you're a follower, not a leader, <laughs> so the joy is for the followers. The leaders are missing. That, That's actually like not in Galatians needed, 5. It sounded like no, you needed I was a vision shift. Reading between the lines. Yeah, you were. Yeah. So that's so, the worst advice I've ever given wow. a group of people was that, you know, come follow me, do this. It's miserable. But get ready, it's going to be miserable. <laughs> so the only thing that I can say is that just about every single time I give my sons advice about their girl issues or dating, my husband says it's the worst advice ever. 
and wow, that, wow. <laughs> that so don't wait, talk to your so mother. You, come so are the- you saying that you agree and that it is the worst advice ever? Or are you just saying that you're accused of giving the worst advice ever? I'm definitely accused of it because usually I'll be like, well, have you told her that? Or have you, you know, I'm yeah. like, of the, oh. go and tell everything. So share, and come, overshare. Yeah, come from it from this perspective. And my husband's like, that's terrible. You don't ever say that to a girl. So um, oh. I, I so think So your we husband have, knows girls better than you do? Is that what we're learning? I just think that we have different ways of approaching okay. um, girls. And okay. um, since I live in a house of five men, I'm usually overruled. Sky, have you ever given bad advice? Never. Ever. That's fantastic. Mm-mm. I will I, say Sky has never given me bad advice. <laughs> my advice is rarely taken. <laughs> That's not when, true. When, not to you. But to, no, I, Maybe I, in your family. I can't, I can't think of something dramatic like that. Okay. that was, I'm sh- I guarantee I've given bad advice. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, what about to your kids? Hmm. I think this is something you might have to pray I, about. I, well, actually, you, <laughs> I don't could, do no you could talk to my wife. Like yeah. I have frequently given my kids bad advice, which I then have to tell them, I was just kidding, you know, don't really do that. Like, <laughs> oh, um, that doesn't count. Like, go jump off well, the roof, like, it'll be count. fun. Like my that son Isaac, count. as we have mentioned on this podcast in the past, is, yeah. he's, he's rather short for his age. And when he was yeah. in elementary school, you get teased a lot. And I'd get so frustrated, I would tell him to tell the other kid, I may be short, but I'm going to get taller, but you're always going to be ugly. <laughs> and, and like that kind of stuff. And then my mm-hmm. wife has to remind me, Sky, he's going to take you seriously. You, <laughs> you, need to, mm-hmm. you need to remind him you're joking about that kind of stuff. Okay. So. My, my sister, when she was like three or four, we were driving in a car and my mom said, let's all confess our sins. And we were supposed to go around the car and confess really? our sins. And got to my little wow. sister and she said, I don't do no sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's like Sky. Sky doesn't do no sin. Of course. Okay. Never. Okay. If Paul wrote an epistle to the modern church, what do you think he'd say? I was reading Corinthians, Galatians and Corinthians these yeah. last few days, and I am blown away about everything he already has said. Yeah, he said a lot. And mm-hmm. well, what's so amazing to me is that he is so firm in his convictions and in his knowledge and in his understanding of who Christ is and what he did. But think about it. Yeah. He only had that like one encounter on the road, mm-hmm. but then He had more than that. Okay, well he had some, <laughs> but still and then he's in prison. It you know, it sounds like most of his sort of depth of knowledge and understanding theologically came from all of that suffering. But his conviction about who Jesus is and what is right is really supernatural. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, a lot of it is. And I think everything in those books is completely yeah. applicable to today. Yeah. Well, one thing people don't often recognize is Paul is taking a lot of his theology and vision from the Old Testament prophets. Right. And he weaves it in. And he weaves it in and applies it now to the church and to the to, to, to the new age in Christ. I, uh, I don't want to put words in Paul's mouth of what he would say to the American church. But I will recommend there is a sermon that was preached by Martin Luther King Jr. I forget in what year. I read it in a in a book that's a, a collection of his sermons, and it's it's titled something like an epistle to the American Church or an epistle to America or something like that or a letter to American Christians. I forget the exact title. Again, I didn't st- you know know this question was coming, mm-hmm. but it's it was written in the 1950s or 60s, and it is so prophetic mm. and amazing. It's really really worth reading. Okay. Mm. So, so Paul, in a sense, already did write an epistle to America. He just channeled it through Martin, Martin Luther King. Well, yeah. I think he all the epistles that he wrote, honestly, they talk about division and they talk about class, you know, we class don't have that stuff. Problem. And they talk about how you treat the stranger and alien. I right. mean, like right. on you know, on down the line in right. every single area of those epistles, they talk about exactly what we're dealing with today. So I just think we yeah. need to reread what he said. Okay, let's reread what he said. In fact, let's stop right now and read several (laughs) epistles aloud together. I'm all for that. Um, What are your thoughts about churches encouraging members to bring guns to church (laughs) and publicly posting that they are armed? Does that really happen? How does this fit within the scope of church history, and how do you think Paul, Peter, and especially Jesus would respond to this current phenomenon? Okay, I have a couple of news stories. Goodness. Mm. Because of this, um, a church in central New York after the Texas shooting says, we are not a gun-free zone. The new sign, the message board outside the lighthouse, 
the Lighthouse Mexico Church of God in central New York. Okay, hold on a second. My brain is having trouble what processing this. What is the Lighthouse this. Mexico we, Church of God? We are not a gun-free, a gun-free church. That means they have guns there. Yes. The message board says, we say it again, we are not a gun-free zone. Um, they are inviting the members to bring their guns to services. The church's official website also includes a scrolling message that says, we are not a gun-free zone, we protect our people. So if you are planning on attacking a church, if that's your goal, good gravy, if you're planning on attacking a church and you're checking out their websites before Mm -hmm. so you can pick which church you're going to attack, so you're looking at all their websites. Very premeditated. This one will warn you this is not the church to go to. Um, they feel that they have a, a, a shooting here is not going to happen. I'm going to protect my people, says the lead pastor. Okay, other story. I hope that church never has an internal conflict. Other story. They'll know how to settle it. Ten paces. <laughs> Count to ten. I think that's still illegal. Husband and wife accidentally shot in church uh, in a church meeting about gun safety. Oh my! No, goodness. come on. Is this an onion story <laughs> no. or it's got to be Babylon Bee? It's no. got to be. A man accidentally shot himself and his wife during a meeting about gun safety at a Tennessee church. The couple, who are in their 80s, were discussing gun protection at a social meeting held at the First United Methodist Church in Teleco Plains when the incident occurred. Uh, the 81-year-old man says, well, I've got my gun on me, before he pulled out his uh, 380 caliber Ruger handgun and removed the magazine. He put the magazine back in and put the gun away, but forgot it was loaded when a person later asked to see it. The man then pulled the trigger with the bullet slicing his palm and penetrating his mm-hmm. wife's abdomen and exiting her right side. Both were treated for non-life-threatening injuries and no charges were made. Mm. They were shot. At, so the, the latest church shooting was because of trying to protect ourselves against church shootings. I don't uh, even know what to say about that. I've, I've written on this issue. I have dialogued on this issue on Facebook. I, people hate me for my thoughts on this issue. It's gotten ugly at times. I have found the conversation to be completely unfruitful. Why do people hate you? I, I don't even want to get into it. It's because I, I, I'm not a, a gun advocate in church. And, and I, I don't want to, I mean, it's, I don't want to derail the whole podcast on this, but I've written about it. People can look it up yeah, and yeah, read it. What'd you write? What'd you write? Don't do that. What'd you write? This we is have, almost one have, of those hey, things I don't want to talk about this anymore. Is, oh, it, we found something. <laughs> it's so big, actually, we probably shouldn't get into it. Just go read his things. It's just, it's one of our questions. It's one of our questions. Plenty more. Okay. I, to, to, this could be a whole to, to, podcast. To, to, to answer in short, I'm not a fan of guns in church. I was wondering how often is there actually a shooting in church? Because my feeling is it's it's the shark syndrome where something sounds so scary that mm-hmm. you assume it happens a lot more than it does and you ignore the things that are normal, like the fact that someone in your church will probably die in a car accident or from cancer in the next 12 months. Well, it's kind of like I think, isn't it? Like the the plane crashes, like yeah. they they're so big and they're so horrific, and so they seem really, more prevalent right. than they really are. Right. And so. Um, okay, so I did a little research. Okay. Would you like to hear what I discovered? I would love to. I didn't actually do the research. Uh, the Gospel Coalition did the research. Um, during the nine years from two thousand and six, two thousand and six to two thousand and fifteen there were approximately 24 church shootings, which is an average of 2.7 per year. So over the last nine years, and this is a shooting in the sanctuary of a church. Is that less than plane crashes in a year? I would think so. There hasn't been a major plane crash in the United States since 2001. Yeah, but we don't have many plane crashes. Hmm. Little ones, little ones. That baseball yeah. player just died in yeah. his little. But a large tiny commercial plane. airliner has not crashed since 2000. But that's not what I'm talking about right now, Scott. Right, just saying. Can I come back to my? Yeah, come over back it was over my here. fault. I'm Can sorry. you get back over here? Okay. <clears throat> if we assume that approximately three church shootings occur every every year in the United States, what is the probability they could occur at any particular church? There are an estimated, now we do some math, there are an estimated 378,000 congregations in the United States, which means the likelihood of any congregation being involved in a shooting in any year is approximately 1 in 126,000, or 0.000079%. Okay, but let's go on. 
If we assume that each congregation meets at least once per week, there are a minimum of 19.6 million church services every year in the United States. That means your odds of being in a church service in which a shooting occurs are at most 1 in 6.5 million or 0.000000015%. That's reassuring. So the argument is, yeah, but if I'm in that tiny fraction... I need to be packing. I need to be packing. And so my simple argument is that the presence of the growing prevalence of guns in our churches actually creates more of a hindrance to ministry yeah. than it does add protection yeah. against... And you've talked to pastors about that. I have talked we've, to pastors. you said about, that. Yes, I have. And, 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 you know, some people just... they want their guns and so they feel safer with them yeah. they want them and they, I have a question, they're kind of though. impervious to yeah. to evidence otherwise so way back when how far back we going adam and eve i mean no back to when Benjamin we, Franklin? back to when maybe back to when Eisenhower? Got everybody like i'm thinking about like you know, when everybody had a gun. Everybody had a gun. There was never anybody had a gun. There was, was, yes, there was, yes, there was, was like, no such thing okay, as that. Okay, when the pilgrims were around and... <laughs> they had muskets. <laughs> okay, so they had muskets. It well, took like 10 minutes to load and they fired one shot. There were times where everybody did have a gun. No. Yes, there were. No, there wasn't. No, there was never a time where everybody There are far everybody more guns gun. per capita in the United States now, now than, than in any other time ever in its history. Before. Okay, but when you think about, like, okay... The, the, the whole society was never hunters. It was never... No, but they, but they had swords. Do you remember when they had swords? Like, every, everybody had... There are more guns in the United States today than there are people? <laughs> no, I didn't know that. There are more guns than people in the United so States. Know, the only country that comes close to America in guns per capita, and they're actually not even that close, is Yemen. It's us and Yemen. And that's a paradise on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that the more guns there are in a state or a city, the more gun violence there is in a state or a city? And if there's a gun in the household, there's a much higher likelihood of a family member being killed by a gun than by an attacker or an intruder being killed by a gun. So if you have a gun in your house and it kills someone, it's probably one of your kids, statistically speaking. Okay, so let me ask you Not this. a very happy statistic. Then how come... We feel like it is, where did this like innate, passionate need to have a gun come from? You're not going to want to know the answer to that. Our culture? Well, yeah, I do. Can I just say our culture? I was assuming, okay, our here, culture. we're going to debunk the things okay. in my brain. I was assuming. <laughs> That's our new game show, Debunk Christian's Brain. Next up, gun control. <laughs> I was assuming in my lack of knowledge that there was a time in America where most people, you know, had to defend themselves. Like you think about no. the old West no, that, where everyone team stop, the, yeah. stop, 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 stop. <laughs> Just let me finish. Okay, where everybody had guns to protect and defend themselves. And so based on that, like their parents needed to make sure they had guns and their parents, you know, and it kind of, so it was just like this, you know, fami familial thing that's passed down and you pass families. down the guns, so, you know. In some and families. So, so wait, let's back up though. That, you're you're kind of giving the popular Hollywood American assumption about the history of guns. Like I said, we're okay. debunking so, my brain. <laughs> here's a couple of facts. Now I know what's in it. We the, were not all Daniel Boone. The, <laughs> the point in American history where, where there was a spike in gun ownership would... It's, this is not rocket science to figure this out, was during the Civil War. Yeah. Because okay, we're there at, you go. we're at war with one another, sure. so people are, yeah. they have guns. Okay. But Johnny, get your gun. The, the unique, oh, Annie. It's the, Annie, get your gun. The unique gun culture that emerged in the southern United States or in the Confederacy wasn't just because of the Civil War, but because of emancipation. Because for the first time, you had, a, what, three or four million African Americans who were set free from slavery who had been enslaved for 400 years and horribly treated and abused by, by their white overseers in the South. And white people post-Civil War in the South were so frightened that the African-American freed slaves would rebel against the whites that they armed themselves to the teeth. And that became the origin of the gun culture in the Southern United States. It was fear over a, a post-slavery revolt, essentially. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that even the Second Amendment and the wording in the Second Amendment, and 
I've studied this at length and read books on it and on and on, and it was driven by mostly uh, James Madison, who was a Virginian slave owner, was all a fear that if you only give the federal government the right to organize an army, which is what the Constitution did, there was no way to put down slave revolts in the southern states. So they wanted the Second Amendment to get Southerners to agree to the Constitution and still have an ability to raise up militias to capture escaped slaves and put down slave results by revolts by arming the citizenry of a state, not just the federal government. Well, somehow, at some point, it became, we need to have these guns and we need to arm ourselves against a government that's going to run amok. And that was a reinterpretation of the Second Amendment and trying to say we needed guns to fight the British and we need guns to fight the federal government if it ever becomes bad. But that was really a Southern Confederate argument, which they tried in the Civil War. That's exactly what they did. The Confederacy believed that they were continuing the legacy of the American Revolution, where the Founding Fathers fought against the British Empire, the Southerners fought against an imperialistic federal government, and we were going to stand up for our community's rights, right? It sounds the same thing. So they did exactly that. They armed themselves and they fought the federal government. And they lost. Would would Jesus bring a gun to church? I think the safe answer on that is no. But, Sky. Yeah. But he told his disciples that it might be a good time to get a sword. Which is the one verse that they go to. Where is every that? Yeah. Where is that? Time. I've never heard that verse. Yeah, Wait a second. It's in Pause. There. What it's does it in say? There. It's What's in there. the verse? Wait, wait, he says, That's why Peter had a sword when they tried to arrest him. And, and he, he, said, he said, oh, this is it. This have, is my time. We have two. And he says, that'll be enough, which isn't even one sword Where per disciple. Where is this verse? What it's are you talking about? It's in the gospel. I forget yeah. which gospel. I don't, we, you see, we, this is why we don't prepare for the podcast. I yeah, can give you the, there's, there's the been lengthy writing Jesus about Jesus says, Here, get a sword? Here's, let's well, back he was, up though. He was talking about when I'm gone and you have to go out now on your own and travel. You might, you need this, you need this, you might need a sword. And the interpretation is, was it for safety on the road or what? There's a wide... Or, might have been for deer hunting. I don't know. Did they hunt swords with deer? <laughs> Did you look it up for us, Jason? Luke 22, 36. What's Luke, the verse? Luke 22, 36. What does it say? Uh, it says, he said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Yeah, you need a purse and a ah. bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Okay. And, and I think it was more for traveling long distances on the road. What's and so the gun people use that as yeah. justification for needing a gun? What's interesting, though, is the, the early church for the first couple centuries is almost universally pacifist in their theology. It isn't until Constantine and Christianity becomes the dominant religion of the Roman Empire, where Christianity and, and empire are meshed, that you begin to get a just war theory, you begin to get a, a justification for for warfare and violence and all these other things, which were non-existent in early Christianity. It just did not exist. So anyway, like I said, I didn't want to open this can of worms because it gets people so riled up on all sides. And I've written on this extensively. I've talked about this in social media and other places, and I have found it utterly unfruitful because there's just no... You either feel one way or the other and there's no in between? Well, I think that's a lot of it. And here, and to be to give a to throw a bone to the advocates of the Second Amendment, as I've studied the issue and read legal experts on it, I actually agree that there probably is no way around the Second Amendment. It does allow for individuals to own guns, short of a constitutional amendment to change it. I think they actually have the legal argument on their side, but that doesn't mean they have the theological or Christian argument on their side. Does that make sense? Uh huh. So anyway. So as a Christian. As a Christian, what? Um, as a Christian, on the one hand, I would want to support people with and help them with their legal rights. But on the other hand. To own abortion? Well, you, you used to have a legal right to own black people. <laughs> so that doesn't work. Let's walk that back. <laughs> <laughs> or as your husband would say, that's the worst advice I've ever heard. <laughs> so, you know, the problem is when you put the Constitution ahead of Christian faith and values, you create a tension. And there's a lot to admire about our Constitution, but it's not an infallible document. It, that's why we have amendments, <laughs> so we can change things about it. And we've used that to, to end slavery and to change uh, voter laws and to, you know, all kinds of things we've done to change the Constitution, but the Second Amendment is so enshrined for a, a, a culture in our country that 
it, okay. it's not going to move. Okay. I'm not sure if it's very inviting. If you want people in your community to come into your door to say, by the way, we've got a lot of guns. But the counter argument is you want people to feel safe when they're in church and people have this belief that if there's lots of guns, they're safe. Well, and maybe there are people out there who think I am going to go to that church because then I'll be safe. Unless someone in that church has mental health issues or just had a big fight with their wife and is now on a or rampage. is eighty something years old and forgets to put the magazine in the gun. <laughs> but you know this this creates a vicious cycle though because the more guns you put into the culture, the more gun violence happens, which yeah. means the more people want to buy guns to protect themselves. And yeah. you, the only people yeah. who really win yeah. are the people making money on selling guns. I'm moving on. Name one thing you would love to learn or accomplish that seems kind of out of reach right now. Hmm. Music career? I want to make a hit movie. I want to make a hit movie. What does hit mean? Uh, it makes more money than it costs. <laughs> <laughs> you lower your standards over time. It's just, well, that, that Fine. Where you can make another movie then, because they say, oh, that did well. Then I want to release a best-selling book. Okay. What does best-selling mean? It's on the New York Times bestsellers list. Oh, okay. And, That's specific. And reaches that status naturally. Really? Not, not through manipulation, as some Christian authors have been known well, to do. you on your high horse. Yeah, that's right. <sighs> okay. What do you want to do? So I have a documentary about France and yeah. D-Day, yeah. and right now it feels really out of reach. And I okay. would like to be able to produce that documentary and it be able to be seen by the world. I don't even need to make money. Uh-oh. I just need not to lose it. That's good. Mm-hmm. But if you made money, then you could make another documentary. That's true, but it may kill me, this documentary, (laughs) and I may not want to make another one. How many times a year do you find yourself taking on projects that later you determine could kill you? Uh, Right now, I have two going. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying. (laughs) And uh, this is the most I've ever felt like I may die at the end of the project. Uh, What are some of Phil's most recent favorite animated properties, TV shows, or movies? I really love Bob's Burgers. That's just too funny. It's not. I've a, never even heard of that. Go watch what Bob's it? Burgers. It's 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 like a sweeter kind of a Family Guy Simpsons. Okay, but where do I watch? Funnier, that? sweeter, and a healthy family dynamic. Really? What, where do I yeah. watch that? So where's the comedy? <laughs> well, I mean, they swear. It's not like young kid friendly. Okay, you know, but but older, like junior high. High school kids, definitely. It's it's my family's favorite show. Um, it's on, what is it on? Comedy Central, FX? I can't remember which. Just, you know. Look Bob's around. Burgers. Yeah, just okay. Google it. Look it up. Bob's Burgers. Movies, eh, animated movies, and they're not working for There's me. There's that new, Pixar's not that new Coco's coming yeah, out. Yeah, Pixar has a new one. I haven't seen it. I don't know it's if it's any yet. good. And The Star is out, the first faith-based animated right. film from What's a that? major Hollywood studio. Have the you Star? seen it? The Star? What is that? It's, it's a the Christmas nativity. film. It's yeah. a nativity film. Have you seen it? No. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Just... It didn't do well over the weekend, though, so it yeah. may, may be in trouble. Well, it was Christmas developed by uh, the Henson Company like 20 years ago. Brian Henson wanted to oh. make it with puppets, and it wow. never happened. And then uh, somebody picked it up and it took it to Sony, and then Sony did it with at an animation studio in Canada for not a ton of money, but more than I get to spend on it. I've actually been wondering if with this Coco movie coming out, which is about the Day of the Dead. Yeah, I wonder... not to be confused with the Book of Life, which was about the Day of the Dead uh, CGI I, two I've... years ago i wonder if some conservative fundamentalist types are going to flip out about kind of the necromancy yeah i'm not that. really interested in it i don't know maybe it's good but i, I just heard much i'm not a big day of the dead fan personally <laughs> me either i don't celebrate the day of the dead i don't you know don't, i'm with you don't pray to my ancestors i just don't get into that yeah okay um and that's it do you have a favorite have you seen anything animated lately that you really really liked um, See, I like I like my life as a, as a zucchini. I've never even heard of that. that. My life is a that zucchini. That sounds like a documentary about veggie tales. It's a, uh, <laughs> a Swiss stop motion movie that's been dubbed into English, but it's only sixty minutes long, so it didn't get a theatrical release. It wasn't long enough. But it's on where is it? It's on iTunes. I watched it on iTunes. But it's a really cute, simple little stop motion. But the story of uh, kids in an orphanage wrestling with the fact that they are in an orphanage and, and they're zucchinis. No, no, that's his nickname. That's his nickname that his, his alcoholic mom gave him, hmm. was Zucchini. How endearing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, my favorite animated ones I've seen recently are the Pixar shorts that are usually in yeah. front of things. I really like those, those shorts. Good. Yeah, you, you can do lots with a short. Yeah. Okay, we're pretty much out of... T- 
out of time. We're going to have, uh, we think we're going to have a Black Friday sale on Faith Blocks. If you've been wanting to check it out, we now have two whole book studies that you can go through with your kids in 15 short videos, like six minute videos. Uh, we have one, the first one's on First John, answering the question, what is a Christian? The second one's on Ephesians, answering the question, what is God's plan? 15 videos you can go through with your kids. Uh, go to faithblocks.com and we're putting them on sale, both of them together for Back Sky Day. Back Sky Day. Back Sky Day. That's my contribution. I, I'm not actually backing Sky in any way, <laughs> but I like his. Uh, I'm backing Sky. Moniker. Oh, I'm backing Sky in many. <laughs> oh, of course. Many ways. Hundreds of ways. All right. What did we just sing about? Talk about that I'm going to sing about. <laughs> hey, everybody, isn't it fun? To show up in church packing a gun. But if you are, oh, 80 or older, then maybe you shouldn't be so much bolder because it uh, might be too late in life to hold your gun without shooting your wife. And uh, maybe we should follow more what Jesus said and turn the other cheek. And use a sword instead. <laughs> use a sword <laughs> instead. <laughs> All right. So everyone, bring a sword to church this Sunday. Just, just your Bible. Right? Or a lightsaber. Sword drill. Can sword we bring drill. lightsabers to yeah, church? Yeah, maybe Jesus meant your Bible instead of your regular don't sword. Don't we believe that? I don't know. Anyway. We use the force or something. Have fun on your Facebook page after this one, Phil. Nonviolent. Yeah, I got stuff to do other than look at the Facebook page. We will uh, have a happy, uh, I almost said Halloween. I thought you say Hanukkah. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Ha happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and Black Friday, and the coming holiday, which will not be named, because apparently we don't do that. See you next week. Bye, everybody. See ya. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. <laughs> <laughs>